Hello, I'm Steve Buck, Chair of the Department of Psychology here at the University of Washington. The lecture you're about to see is part of our annual Alan Edwards Psychology Lecture Series. Professor Edwards was affiliated with the Department of Psychology for half a century until his death in 1994. He was an outstanding teacher, researcher, and writer who introduced new statistical techniques that are credited with changing the way modern psychological research is conducted. Allen also permanently enhanced the intellectual climate of UW Psychology by endowing the Allen Edwards Lectureship, which since 1999 has brought an impressive list of renowned psychologists to the UW campus to interact with faculty and students. Now, the annual Allen Edwards Psychology Lecture Series presents the excitement of psychological research and its tangible benefits to both local and national audiences. The lecture you're about to watch is one of a pair given back-to-back -back that matched a UW Psychology faculty member with a visiting researcher to talk about a topic of great public and scientific interest. Well, good evening. I'm Steve Buck, Chair of the Department of Psychology here at the University of Washington. Welcome to this evening's continuation of the Alan Edwards Psychology Lecture Series. This series is presented by the Department of Psychology, the College of Arts and Sciences, and the University of Washington Alumni Association, and is funded by a generous endowment from Alan L. Edwards. The topics in this series illustrate how psychological research serves humanity. The University of Washington receives more research support money than any other public university in the country, topping $1 billion this year. The psychology department alone receives almost $10 million annually in research funding that helps us advance our knowledge of basic science, directly serve people in our community and around the globe, and train our undergraduate and graduate students. Tonight's lecture addresses family values and culture in the successful adjustment of ethnic minority adolescents. Our speaker is Dr. Rand Conger. Dr. Conger is the Distinguished Professor of Human Development, Family Studies, and Psychology at the University of California, Davis. Dr. Conger's program of research focuses on, on social, economic, cultural, and individual characteristics that either increase or reduce risk for social and emotional problems, substance abuse, and psychiatric disorders over time. Findings from Dr. Conger's research have been published in over 200 books, book chapters, and journal articles, and over the past 30 years have been supported by a series of federal grants from the National Institutes of Health. In addition, the significance of his scholarly activities has been recognized through awards from professional organizations including the National Association for Rural Mental Health, the National Council on Family Relations, the American Sociological Association, and the International Association for Relationship Research. Um, he also has been elected fellow of both the American Psychological Association and the National Council on Family Relations. And, oh yes, this distinguished career started here with his PhD in sociology from the University of Washington. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rand Conger. Thank you, Steve. It really is a delight to be here this evening uh, as part of the Alan, Le Alan Edwards Lecture Series. I had the, uh, the extreme privilege of getting two, uh, taking two statistics courses from Alan Edwards when I was a student here, and he was an amazing teacher and, uh, and highly respected by his students and, and people who attended his classes. I'm going to talk tonight about some, some adolescents who we've now studied for about 20 years, adolescents who we began to study back in 1989 and who we continue to study today as they're raising their children and starting their families. And that too has been a real privilege in terms of having the scientific opportunity to follow a cohort of individuals across such a long period of time. The uh, study involves adolescents who grew up during a time of extreme economic stress in rural Iowa. During the 1980s, there was something called the farm crisis. And during that farm crisis, uh, numerous farms were lost, uh, banks went under, small towns disappeared, 
And in fact, rural Iowa was described by some as a rural ghetto in the sense that uh, small towns were becoming ghettoized. Stores were closing, uh, the banks were closing, and uh, places were just drying up and going away, and people with resources were leaving, and what was left behind were people without resources. So this cohort of rural adolescents, a total of 558 altogether, with approximately equal numbers of boys and girls, lived through that crisis as they were growing up. In this uh, cohort of adolescents, we had 451 who were from two parent families uh, from the rural countryside, and another 107 early adolescents from one parent families from the same areas in Iowa. We have interviewed these individuals uh, from uh, as early as seventh grade uh, to today. In fact, we're, right now we're out in the field studying uh, the cohort members, their children when they have children, and their romantic partners uh, if they're married, cohabiting, or uh, steadily involved with a single romantic partner. We've had very good retention, <coughs> uh, almost 90% retention uh, since the beginning of the study, which is extremely high. And one way to get good retention uh, is to try to keep them interested in the project, make them uh, make it their project, and I think today the members of this study really do feel that it's their project. In fact, we get phone calls from them asking us when, they're gonna, when we're going to be back out. And the, final, uh, and the final frosting on the cake is pay them a lot of money. <laughs> and it helps a great deal. In the Family Transitions Project, we've been interested in adolescent social, emotional, cognitive, and physical development. And we've been interested in social and economic influences on development, born in large part because of the farm crisis and the extreme uh, deprivation that many of these families experienced uh, early in the study. We've also been interested in the successful transition to adulthood and how people succeed in, in work and educational pursuits, establishment of intimacy and romantic relationships, and uh, in one of the most interesting parts of the study today, how early experiences in the family of origin influence the capacity to become an effective parent and raise the next generation of children. Adolescence, as you, as you know, is a time of risk. There are pressures for rapid change, increasing expectations of independence and self-sufficiency, increasing expectations by adolescents of adult prerogatives. Adolescents want to have the same prerogatives of people many years older than themselves, or at least they think oftentimes that they want to have those prerogatives. There's ambiguity about the future and uncertainty whether or not people will be able to make a successful transition to adulthood after they leave high school and their school adolescent years. There's also this disjunction in biological development. On the one hand, you have puberty and sexual maturation pushing toward uh, greater pressure to assume adult prerogatives. Uh, involving things like sex, the use of substances, and freedom of choice. On the other hand, the pace of brain development as far as the prefrontal cortex uh, doesn't keep up. Uh, the prefrontal cortex doesn't fully develop until about the mid-20s is my understanding, and the prefrontal cortex is what accounts for the uh, executive functions such as planning, self-control, and problem solving. So you have a biologically mature individual wanting to realize the fruits of that biological maturity without uh, adequate cognitive uh, uh, capacities in terms of impulse control and, and planning. Now, mind you, adolescents vary a great deal, and I'm not saying that every single adolescent uh, doesn't know how to control their impulses, and in fact, they differ a great deal, and we'll talk about that uh, in just a minute. But what is important is that wrong choices during this period of time can have very long-term adverse consequences. For example, uh, teenage pregnancy uh, and loss of supportive ties with family can occur. And these can lead to losses of educational and employment opportunities, and in the worst case scenarios, long-term emotional and behavioral problems. Now, if adolescence is a time of risk, we can think about adulthood in many ways as a time of recovery the prefrontal cortex becomes more fully developed. Education, uh, the educational goals of the individual are typically completed by the mid-20s or shortly thereafter. There tends to be entry into long-term work, into careers and so on. 
There's entry into more stable romantic relationships and the establishment of new families. And there's a reduction in ambiguity and self-doubt. A person in their mid-20s may not be making a great living, but at least they have established some degree of independence uh, and, they're, and they're making some sort of living. Well, let's think a minute about the adolescence hypotheses then. The hypothesis is that things are <clears throat> difficult during adolescence. If it's true that adolescence is a time of risk, it should have significant, uh, significant uh, I impacts on uh, psychological and social events. So, for example, one's sense of mastery, self-esteem, and feelings of positive affect might decline during the adolescent years because you're struggling with self-doubts, you're struggling with what, knowing whether or not uh, you have the ability uh, to uh, make the transition successfully. Anxiety and depression, we would think, would increase. Risky sexual involvements as sexual maturation occurs should increase. Uh, as one experiments with adult prerogatives, substance use should increase, and problem con a con conduct problems should increase uh, as people uh, fail to adequately control impulses that they're now capable of expressing. Now, if the, t if the adulthood hypothesis is uh, the, about recovery from these kinds of problems is true, then during the adult years, a sense of mastery, self-esteem, and feelings of positive affect should increase. Anxiety and depression should decline. Risky sexual involvement should decline. Substance use, conduct problems, and so on should also show declines from uh, heights achieved during the adolescent years. In our Family Transitions Project, our study of these over 500 adolescents, we followed them in these analyses across eight different points in time, from an average age of 14 to 15 years to an average age of 27 to 28 years. We used standard measures for each variable, variables like self-esteem and so on. And we used growth curve modeling to determine statistical significance of changes over time. Let's look at mastery for a minute. Again, the hypothesis would be that mastery would decline during the adolescent years, and that, uh, but it should increase during the adult years. This period of time, 1991, that would be about 14 or 15 years of age. And by 1994 right here, we have reached late adolescence, completion of, of uh, <clears throat> uh, high school, and the adolescents are, uh, are beginning to, to move into the adult years. Well, self or mastery, excuse me, a sense of mastery, a sense of being able to control your own fate, really didn't decline. It was relatively flat um, during these years, uh, but it didn't go up either. It remains at what is a low level when we compare it to what happens when people enter their adult years, when they complete the transition to adulthood. By 1999, we're out about uh, 23 years of age, and when we, when we get out to 2003, we're out to uh, 27 years of age. So this is consistent, pretty consistent with the hypothesis that adolescent is a time of risk, a time of self-doubt, a time when people don't feel in control of their fates, and as they move to adulthood and begin to uh, succeed in adult accomplishments, a sense of control and mastery goes up. What about self-esteem? Here we see more what the, high, the adolescent hypothesis would suggest. By the way, the, the, the red uh, uh, parts of the figure apply to the girls in the sample, the blue to the boys in the sample, and the black line is the average for the entire sample, boys and girls combined. And you can see that self-esteem, in fact, for both boys and girls, tends to go down during the adolescent years. Again, around 14 to 15 uh, years of age, out to about 18 or 19 years of age. During this time of, of difficulties, competing biological processes, of increasing demands, of ambiguity about the future, people feel they're less worthy over time. However, as they move into the adult years, their self-esteem goes up and then levels out at, at, a, at a much higher level than it was during adolescence as they move into the adult years, consistent with the idea that the adult years are a time of recovery. Positive affect. This is a really interesting slide. Positive affect has, has to do with uh, feelings about how wonderful or how bad life is. So positive affect 
has the the scale for measuring that has items on it like life I feel like life is a wonderful experience I wake up every day feeling good about getting up I enjoy life and I think it's really interesting to notice that uh, around age 14 15 people in this sample were really pretty high on life and how what how wonderful it is and then it drops down during adolescent adolescence it, it only goes up a bit going into the adult years so there's something we're moving we're losing uh, from that was going on back in childhood and adolescence but we are losing something and this was an unexpected finding certainly things improve a bit during the adult years but some of the wonder is gone and perhaps one of the things that we as social scientists and behavioral scientists should be thinking about is how you bring that wonder back in as we move uh, to the adult years. Anxiety uh, is relatively high during adolescence but declines during the adult years. Depression increases during adolescence but declines during the adult years. Number of sexual partners as would be expected increases markedly during the adolescent years, plateaus and then starts to go down during the adult years as uh, this uh, we would hope would be what would occur uh, as uh, people enter into marriage and romantic relationships but we also collect data on infidelity and it probably doesn't go down as much as one might think. Uh, alcohol use problems has to do with using alcohol to the point that you actually have difficulties in work or school or difficulties in social relationships perhaps even have problems with the law as a result of your drinking. These kinds of alcohol use problems go up dramatically during the adolescent years, plateau a bit, and then do drop significantly during the uh, adult years well into the 20s. <clears throat> Antisocial behavior, delinquencies, uh, violence, theft, bad behavior increases uh, dramatically during, uh, adole during adolescence and then drops and almost disappears for most people uh, during uh, the adult years. Only very rare individuals, a very small proportion of the population, remain highly antisocial into the adult years. That will vary by context, uh, of course, but that is a, a different talk. Interestingly, we also see trends toward normative behaviors occurring during adolescence. So, uh, simply drinking, not drinking that causes problems, but a moderate level of drinking goes up during the adolescent years and then levels out, suggesting, again, these aren't alcohol problems. This is just, you know, this is just coming to view alcohol as a normal part of your life that occurs during the adolescent years and becomes a, a, a pretty even. By the time you hit early adulthood, you've sort of established a drinking pattern and that tends to continue through, uh, at least through the 20s. Tobacco use, this is kind of a sad story. A tobacco use increases, of course, during the adolescent years, and it doesn't tend to go back down, suggesting how addictive a substance and how uh, difficult a substance tobacco is for people who become uh, regular uh, smokers. And, and in this sample, it also included people who chewed tobacco. Uh, which is a, a pretty interesting part of rural life, uh, but it doesn't—it doesn't seem to go away. It holds on. Now, all of this is very interesting, and it seems consistent with the early hypothesis that things, bad things, are going to increase, good things are t going to tend to go down or be fairly low during the adolescent years as a time of risk, and then adulthood as a time of recovery sees uh, some uh, repair in these kinds of problems that occur during the adolescent years. However, not all adolescents experience the same degree of developmental problems and it would be particularly worthwhile to try to stem some of the difficulties that occur during the adolescent years because, of course, when they occur uh, with frequency, they can create long-term problems. So involvement with numbers of sexual, problem, sexual partners can lead to early pregnancy. Uh, problems with uh, depression and anxiety can actually lead to, uh, to disorders, mental disorders of various kinds. We know, for example, that increases in, significant increases in depressive symptoms across the years of adolescence can lead to actual depressive disorders uh, by late adolescence and early adulthood, and those can, can become chronic and exist throughout one's life. 
It turns out, though, that there are certain kinds of social and personal resources, advantages or adaptive capacities that we would expect to create resi resilience to the re risks of adolescence. And in the, in the Family Transitions Project, we study resilience to adolescent risk at the community, family, peer, and personal levels and view resilience as a process whereby these different domains of experience uh, will uh, tend to reduce the normally occurring risks of adolescence. In terms of adolescent resources, and I won't go into a great detail about how we measure these things, <clears throat> but they're all aggregated variables. So we have an aggregate variable that measures community resources, and it involves all of these, ver all of these uh, measures involve both parent and adolescent report. So parents and adolescent report, adolescents report on how good their schools are, how good the services are for families and children in their communities, how much financial and social stability there is in the, in the community, and especially in these communities, family engagement in the communities. In rural areas, in small towns, a family that's engaged in the community has enormous advantages in terms of support from that community. We have peer resources. Uh, if peers are available and supportive friends, if they are low in terms of deviant behavior, and if they're high in terms of in conventionality, in terms of supporting uh, good schoolwork and, uh, and conventional ambitions for the future, these would be what we would call a, a, a peer group that would promote uh, resilience to adolescent risks. Now, notice I'm turning things on their heads Normally we talk about peers being bad influences. Peers can be very good influences, as you will see. Uh, family, uh, families with high resources would be families that are high on warmth and support of the adolescents, low in conflict, low in psychopathology. That is, the parents uh, don't tend to have a lot of disorders. And in this particular study, we also studied the siblings. So siblings would be low in terms of their uh, psychiatric disorders. Uh, families uh, that are uh, high in resources would tend to experience low economic stress. They would tend to be of higher SES, better incomes, better educated parents, and so on. Now, part of, the, part of what we also looked at would be what we would call an adaptive adolescent. What kind of adolescent is one that tends to be fairly resilient to these kinds of problems that we've seen during adolescence? Uh, one who, that is high in impulse control, who plans for the future, one who has low antisocial behaviors, that, or low antisocial values, that is, they have a strong sense of what's morally correct and what's not morally correct. They tend to be agreeable and work well with others. They get along with others. They have good problem-solving skills. They work hard in school. They tend to enjoy school. They tend to actively cope with challenges in their lives rather than running away from them and they tend to have conventional tr or traditional beliefs. They accept the general moral order. They accept the idea that education is important, getting along with others is important. So based on these ideas, we developed a little model. Now remember, we have both single and two-parent families, and we felt that single-parent families, uh, kids being raised in single-parent families would suffer a reduction in terms of the kind of community resources they experienced peer resources, and family resources. Remember that single parent families tend to be low income and there's only one parent. And one parent, uh, just in terms of uh, a single parent, is more likely to be outnumbered by the kids in the family than two parents. At least with two parents, you have the opportunity to have uh, support in terms of your parenting behaviors. It does not mean that all single, that it does not mean that single parent, single parents are, are bad parents. It means that they have more that they have to deal with, and they can be swamped in that process at times. Uh, single parent families, uh, a single parent is less uh, able to monitor as effectively, typically, as, as a two parent family, and that can lead to getting involved with, with uh, peers who are not uh, as appropriate as we would hope kids would have. Community resources, single parent families, uh, when, a, when a divorce occurs, uh, parents oftentimes need to move to a, a lower income area. They need to adapt to a lower income lifestyle, and they might end up in a community that is, uh, is, tends to be lower socioeconomic uh, status. 
Now, in, the, in our little resilience model here, we thought that community resources, uh, peer resources, and family resources would all tend to pr promote this adaptive adolescent. An adolescent, when you, when you, have, a, when you have a good, uh, good and, uh, resourceful family, good community resources, good peer resources, you tend to develop a more conventional orientation. You tend to uh, develop a greater control of impulses uh, with the idea in mind that you do have a future that's promising and you wouldn't want to undermine that future. So an adaptive adolescent, we thought all of these community and peer and family uh, uh, resources would channel their influence through this adaptive adolescent and it would be the adaptive adolescent who would, uh, that, that would influence developmental outcomes. So for example, the adaptive adolescent should show greater, be positively related to greater self-esteem across the years of adolescence or it should be negatively related to problematic outcomes like depression over the years of adolescence. So we couldn't have been more wrong, by the way, in some of these predictions, as you'll see in a minute. Actually, more wrong in a good way. So in this analysis, we focused on some select variables. We selected a, an important positive outcome, self-esteem, a sense that you're a worthwhile human being. Uh, we looked at a negative outcome in terms of emotions, depressed mood. And then we looked at two important health risking behaviors. Uh, number of sexual partners per year, and alcohol problems, problems with alcohol. So let's look first at adolescent self-esteem. <clears throat> Here you can see, uh, notice there's, I'm sorry, I failed to point this out. We looked at the level of self-esteem at the, at, at the end of adolescence at age, age, age 18 or 19, and then we looked at change in self-esteem across the years of adolescence. And <clears throat> notice that, the, sure enough, Adaptive adolescents tend to show greater self-esteem by the end of adolescence. Adolescents raised in communities with high levels of resources demonstrated greater increases in self-esteem across the years of adolescence. But notice some of these strange findings. If you're high on family resources, by the way, this uh, arrow shouldn't be there. The arrow is supposed to go in that direction. I just caught that last night. Uh, but family resources are negatively related to positive changes in self-esteem across adolescence. That doesn't make any sense, according to our little theory. Peer resources are negatively related to change in self-esteem, positive change in self-esteem. And the adaptive adolescent is negatively related to change, positive change in self-esteem. That makes no sense whatsoever in terms of our theory. <clears throat> However, when we... Uh, looked at change more carefully and we looked at for those adolescents who had low resources sure enough their change in self-esteem their, their change in positive adjustment did increase across the years of adolescence but it never reached the same level as those who had high resources and you notice those with high resources it actually declines their self-esteem actually declined just slightly, but the two, two curves never come together. The, the adolescents with low resources across all years of adolescence are always lower in self-esteem than adolescents from high resource environments, and that explains those strange uh, negative findings. By the way, <clears throat> whenever there's a, a plus or a minus here, that means that, that that particular pathway in the model was statistically significant. And that's the direction of the effect. Well, what about adolescent depression? This is a fascinating one because our theory had said that it would be the adaptive adolescent bolstered by the resources in their environment. The adaptive adolescent would be the one who would be less likely to be depressed, but these resource variables would have no direct influence on depressed mood. In fact, we find something quite different than that. It's peer resources. When, when adolescents, at least in this study, when adolescents had peers who were supportive, who were available, who were warm, who tended to be low in deviant behavior, who tended to, uh, who tended to reinforce conventional pursuits, those kinds of peer resources decreased the probability of becoming depressed over the years of adolescence. On the other hand, we have that strange, uh, another strange finding again. 
adaptive adolescents actually tended to become more depressed in terms of, of uh, changes in depression across the years of adolescence. Well, what's going on? <clears throat> we see the same kinds of things. Adolescents low in resources declined in depressed mood across the years of adolescence. Those high in resources increased in depressed mood across the years of adolescence. But notice again, the mean levels never come together. The, the adolescents with low resources in their background <coughs> excuse me, always experience more depression. Those with high resources always experience less depression. What about number of adolescent sexual partners? Again, no, oh, uh, I'm sorry, I said the wrong thing. Community resources decrease the number of sex partners that adolescents become involved with in any given year. Peer resources decrease the number of sex partners and the adaptive adolescent decreases the number of sex partners by the end of adolescence. There's no change uh, in number, none of these variables predict the rate of change in the number of sex partners across the years of adolescence. Here we have both these background resource variables and the adaptive capacity of the individual adolescent influencing the risks that they will take in terms of the number of sexual partners they become engaged with. So what do the findings say? <clears throat> the trends in positive outcomes during adolescence and adulthood uh, <clears throat> are exactly what we predicted. Self-esteem is either low, uh, self-esteem, mastery, and positive affect are, e are either low or declining during adolescence, and um, depressed mood, anxiety, and so on <clears throat> increase during the adolescent years. Risky behaviors tend to go up, alcohol problems, sexual partners, antisocial behavior, in terms of the frequency of alcohol use and tobacco use, interestingly, those went up and then flattened out in the adult years, showing kind of the uh, normalization of those activities into the adult years. So we see <clears throat> the adolescent risk. We see the, the adult recovery, <clears throat> as we hypothesize would be the case um, for, for the transition from adolescence to adulthood. One of the important things about resilience that we found, though, was that resilience is not primarily a quality of the adolescent. Many people talk about <clears throat> the resilient adolescent or the resilient child. Resilience during adolescence appears to involve significant interplay <clears throat> among family, peer, and community resources. And these interacting social processes foster better developmental outcomes. <clears throat> Just a, as a quick review, self-esteem was promoted by community, peer, and family resources, as well as adaptive uh, adolescent resources. Depressed mood was primarily reduced by peers. Uh, alcohol problems were reduced by family and peer resources and so on. So peers, family, and the community context have an enormous impact on resilience to the natural kinds of risks that occur during the adolescent years. So adolescence is a time of risk, these data suggest. Adulthood does appear to be a time of recovery, and resilience to the risks of adolescence involve both social processes and individual adaptability. In terms of practical implications, it says that if we want to promote resilience, it's more than just having uh, programs uh, with individual uh, adolescents. Uh, we need uh, resilient, we need programs that's uh, focus on social processes, preventive education programs. Uh, it could, can be ther therapeutic interventions, but it also involves public policies that promote social resources and programs that could be targeted at, at schools and at individual, uh, inter uh, individual adolescents as well. So this was a study of disadvantaged, significantly disadvantaged adolescents raised in a rural environment, which in a way is a minority population because the rural environments are declining rather rapidly and fewer and fewer, a lower and lower proportion of our population is in rural environments. But I want to just give you a, a little bit of a background for a study <coughs> that uh, Anna Marikausi and I uh, are, have just launched down in California. It's like this Iowa study. It's a, a significant cohort of fifth grade uh, Mexican origin children growing up in the Sacramento area of California. 
and we're going to try to follow them exactly as we did uh, the adolescents in Iowa, starting a little bit earlier because, as we know, uh, adolescents are maturing earlier and earlier, so we needed to start at a little earlier age, about 10 or 11 years of age. We call it the California Families Project. A number of scientists have come together to work on this project, including myself and, and Anamari Kalsay. <clears throat> the goal is to study 650 Mexican origin families and children in the greater Sacramento region to understand the origins of successful development from late childhood to adulthood, very much like the study I was just talking about. Only now, the difficulties will be quite, quite different because now we're dealing with issues, issues of different culture, we're dealing with issues of discrimination, we're dealing with people who are even more impoverished uh, than the, the Iowa families. These families represent the fastest growing segment of the U.S. population. Over 50% of the births in California today occur to families of Mexican origin. But we do seek to include families with a diversity of incomes, education, and family history from this population. Just to give you a sense of the people coming into this study, now we, we've just begun this, and these are data hot off the press, but it gives you a description of the kind of sample that we're dealing with with this project. <clears throat> As with uh, many uh, situations where a number of the families are immigrant families, the mothers and the fathers, oh, by the way, the, um, this is the Sacramento School District, the SCUSD, this is the Woodland School District, which is a smaller metropolitan area just outside of Sacramento. Um, the mothers and fathers tend to speak Spanish in the home. They do their interviews in Spanish. That's true in Sacramento, and it's also true in Woodland. The children speak English. And, uh, and oftentimes we'll have the children in our interviews speaking English, the um, uh, parents speaking Spanish, and even when we do videotapes of them interacting together, sometimes the parents are using one language, and the children are using another language. Country of birth, most of the children were uh, born in the United States. Uh, by far the majority of parents were born in Mexico. That surprised us. We expected in Northern California we'd have more families where the parents were born in, uh, <clears throat> in the United States. It's not true. And these are families of Hispanic background picked at random from lists of schools, uh, from school lists of, of parents with Hispanic surnames. These families come from all over Mexico, states from all over Mexico. Uh, <clears throat> average age of the parents is uh, mid to late 30s. Uh, in both school districts, the children are between 10 and 11 years of age. The fascinating thing about this is the age of these parents, the ages of these parents are almost exactly the same as the ages of the parents in the Iowa study that I just talked about. Marital status, uh, by far the majority of parents are married. Uh, some have never married, but they've lived together uh, uh, with their children, all of their, the, the children's lives. And so 73% are two-parent families, 80% are single-parent families, 80% 73% two-parent, 80% two-parent, and then the minority are single-parent families. I want to tell you just a, a quick, just briefly, uh, say something about stereotyping related to ethnicity and background. Mexican origin families are poor on average. Now, we were, in our study, we have some who are doctors and lawyers and, and chief executives and everything else in the community, but on average, they tend to be working poor. And when we submitted our grant proposal to do this study to the Scientific Review Committee at the National Institutes of Health, and we estimated that by far the majority of the families in the study would be two-parent two families because that fits with Mexican traditions, they said, you can't be right because four poor families are single-parent families. And you see what we found. We had to fight with them about that. Uh, actually, they had the money and we lost. Uh, uh, but, but we're going to win in the end because we're going to be able to show that these stereotypes run deep even with supposedly educated people who should know better. Uh, child gender, uh, approximately equally male and female in Sacramento, more females than males in Woodland. Uh, not entirely surprising. Uh, the girls tend to be more willing to, to uh, be involved. I think we're continuing to collect new families. I think the gender difference will uh, 
uh, even out in Woodland. This is just quickly to show you, I just want to show you that the majority of mothers and fathers in this study never completed high school. And in fact, the majority of them uh, were educated, got their uh, initial years of education, or even all of their years of education in, in Mexico. But if you just do a quick tally of the percentages, over 50%, oftentimes over 60%, have not completed high school. Very different than the Iowa study, where the majority of parents had at least a year or two of college. Employment status. Notice we don't have a lot of unemployed parents. Uh, only five to four to six percent of the parents indicate that they're unemployed. We have a lot of mothers who are homemakers, uh, full-time homemakers, but these are families that work. They're poor on average, but they work, and they work hard. It's an extremely hard-working population. <clears throat> you notice here, uh, I didn't do a formal test of poverty line, but th but 30 percent, probably uh, closer to 40 percent of the families, if you do an official um, um, calculation, are below the poverty line. So these are families who work but still live below the poverty line. Health insurance. They don't have much health insurance. Mothers and fathers, uh, on average, uh, over 50% of them don't have any health insurance. Uh, a larger proportion of the children do, uh, but I'm sorry, uh, a larger proportion of the children have health insurance. But this is a perfect example of families who are living below the poverty line on the margins in every way and also on the margins in terms of going under completely it, should they experience any kind of economic calamity, or any kind of medical uh, crisis. Neighborhood quality, but you'll see by far the majority say that there's never or almost never violence or property damage or theft or unsafe elements in the neighborhood. But think about your own background. Nearly 30% are saying that there's violence in the neighborhood. That's amazing amounts of violence because that includes stabbings, shootings, uh, and very, very severe forms of violence. So a lot of these families are experiencing very significant hazards in their neighborhoods. Uh, just quickly, we hear a lot about parents uh, from <coughs> minority populations having very bad relationships with the schools. We're not finding that to be the case. And by the way, we're, we're cooperating closely with the school districts in terms of doing this study. You'll see that in terms of uh, the parents' perceptions of schools reporting whether or not teachers at this school treat Mexican-American parents with respect, by far the majority of parents say they are treated with respect at school, uh, which is, is terrific. And I have shared these data with the superintendents of both school districts, and they breathe an enormous sigh of relief. Although the superintendent at, in Sacramento said, you know, we're not doing quite as well as they're doing in Woodland. We need to fix that. So contrary to what you sometimes hear about families of, of, of um, minority status being ignored by the schools or not being helped by the schools, we're finding quite a different attitude, at least on the part of school administration uh, in this area of California. Uh, <clears throat> they feel that uh, the, the parents feel their children are supported at school. The, the mothers and the fathers, sometimes we hear with Mexican uh, origin families that they really aren't very interested in education as far as their, their children are concerned. The reality is that many of these families have come to the United States so that their children can have greater educational opportunity. And you can see all of them, by far the majority of them, want their children to pursue advanced education. One big problem that we're seeing you can see that if we interviewed them in English, uh, the mothers uh, help a lot, engage in a high level of help with homework. Notice if they speak Spanish, they're not able to help as much with homework. This is an issue we're really going to deal with in this study. It's a place where kids want education, parents want their kids to have education. They're really behind the eight ball in terms of the parents being able to help in a school a system where their children are learning in English. Uh, kids like school, uh, and they, they like to do well in school, the majority of them. They think that they have a chance to grow up and be successful. They think it's important to finish high school. Again, they are not in the main against completing 
education, they don't think it's unimportant. Uh, the, by far the majority of children say they want to, to achieve a college degree. Uh, and many of the students are actually doing quite well in school, at least according to ratings by mothers and fathers. So our long-term goals here are to follow these children over the transition from childhood to adolescence and well into adulthood. We would like to, this study to last 20 or 30 years just as the Iowa study has lasted. We will follow the students who drop out of school to find out what's happened. Far too high rates of, of school dropout in this population. And we hope to gain a much better understanding of what contributes to those who succeed from what is a challenging background for most of the families in the study and we help to develop more effective prevention and intervention programs for this particular population, as well as others. And I thank you. So thank you, Dr. Conger. Uh, we have time for questions. And while people are getting to the microphone, I have one that I'll ask. I know that you haven't had time yet to track changes over time in your California sample. But I wonder if you have gotten far enough into data collection to be able to characterize whether there are any differences, major differences in the positive and negative psychological variables that you're measuring between the California sample and the Iowa sample. Are you seeing big differences in any categories to start out with uh, in the psychological variables? I think we see, we see more, uh, more adjustment problems in the, in the California sample. <clears throat> the kids are, are growing up in much more dangerous neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And so we, we are seeing earlier onsets of involvement with alcohol, uh, probably even some drug use. And even in fifth grade, we're seeing some gang membership. So it's a different phenomena. OK, uh, question. We'll start over here. This is a question in regards to the Iowa study. You talked about the hypothesis of recovery in adulthood. But looking at some of the charts, it looked like there was, um, I think, 1999, the age about 23, 24, there seemed to be a change in um, self-esteem and uh, those other things. So I was curious if you guys are adapting the adulthood hypothesis to look at different stages within adulthood or as opposed to, you know, 19 and on is just one stage. We are. The, the study is continuing and um, we, we hope to follow these. Uh, we're just submitting the continuation grant proposal, in fact, in July. We hope to follow the, um, <clears throat> the original cohort of adolescents right into their mid-30s and hopefully beyond that into their 40s because now they're, they're approaching the age that their parents were when the study began. And we can really see uh, how their development compares with the places their parents were when the study was initiated. We do expect to see changes. One of the part of the study, an interesting part of the study is the, the, um, um, the study of psychiatric disorder. And we have been amazed at the amount of, of new disorders that have occurred during the 20s, something entirely unexpected and something that is a little bit different than this uh, adulthood as a time of, of recovery. And we are thinking that some of the kinds of disorders that we sh we're seeing relate to a whole new set of pressures around having a family, being responsible for supporting a family, dealing with problems in marriages, dealing with uh, kids who can be problematic at times. So we certainly continue to study changes and don't assume that everything's going to remain the same uh, beyond the age of 27. Okay. So we'll take another question over here. Go ahead. Um, I couldn't help but notice, um, I noticed that there were more Spanish-speaking parents in contrast to more English-speaking parents that were recruited. And oftentimes, language can serve as a barrier in terms of um, opportunities. And I've noticed in the literature as well that the families that have the least resources are often the ones that are hardest to recruit into um, studies. What is it about Spanish-speaking families that make them more motivated to participate in these studies? And I'm curious to see um, what your thoughts are about that. I'm, I'm always amazed <clears throat> because I'm quite sure, although we don't ask the question, I'm quite sure that, that some of the families in our study are probably um, 
are probably undocumented. <clears throat> but our finding after 30 years of working with families of different types, including families who have been on the carpet for child abuse or child neglect or uh, families of minority or majority status, is that people really do want to tell their story. And if you can make a convincing case to them that the story they tell will be helpful to families in the future, that we'll make a determined effort to take this information and use it to help people's lives in the future, they're willing to, uh, they're willing to spend time with us. And in fact, they generally enjoy the opportunity to, to express their points of view. It takes a lot of work. And, and you have to do a lot of different things uh, to recruit them into the study. You have to convince them that it's worthwhile. We use economics incentives, and that's, that helps a lot as well. But I don't think that that's an unusual thing to do. You know, if you think about yourself, you would be a lot more likely to expend eight or nine hours of your time uh, in a year if somebody paid you to do it than if somebody didn't pay you to do it. So the economic incentives help, but they have to become hooked into the study, especially if they're going to continue. And, um, and these families know that, that Mexican children and Mexican families, by and large, have been ignored in the social sciences literature. And we know very little about the development of these children. We know very little about what accounts for success. And there are many hypotheses in the study related to differences in culture and cultural traditions that we think will play an important role in the resilience process. If that helps, it's going to be a major assistance uh, to these families and these communities in the future. Okay, take a question over here. Uh, I took a statistics class with Richard Catalano in the School of Social Work here, mm -hmm. and he worked on a study called, I believe, the Raising Healthy Children, and right. I think later, Raising Healthy Families, uh, and it related to resilience of, of adolescents. I just wondered if there's any comparison of your findings to that studies, or if you could just share a little bit the crossover. I, I know Dr. Catalano quite well, and, and we do compare results from time to time. And I suspect that in many ways we do find parallel findings in our different studies, which is good. It's always nice to find that what you're what you've discovered replicates. Uh, rather than at all being ephemeral or, or, uh, or a characteristic of only one population. Okay, okay so we have another question here. Um, I was interested in the, 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 what you showed about the, uh, the English-speaking parents and the, the, the parents that speak Spanish. I know when I grew up, um, one of the hard things was that uh, my parents didn't speak English, so it was hard to be motivated to go to school. Right. They're, they're, and it's so true because my parents' education was sixth grade. And so it was really hard to be motivated in school. Um, I have a daughter now, and I'm, I, I went to school, I went to college, and because I speak English, I motivate her to go to school. And I noticed that the reason I asked this question, because I think it's a huge issue, and I know that I work with kids now, and uh, one of the situations I see is that the kids that I work with, um, because the parents don't speak English, and they're not motivated to go to school, so they tend to get into more trouble, and they don't care about school. And I think that's happening a lot, and it's a big issue that I think that I'm, I'm trying to help out with my kids, but what is it that you guys are doing, or you, you plan on doing to help that population, to help them be motivated to go to school? Because I think they want to, but because the parents don't have that motivation, they think they kind of, they, they lose themselves in the, in the uh, society. Right. I think most of the parents in our study <clears throat> are motivated for their children to get education. But like you say, they're handicapped in the sense that they don't know the language. <clears throat> they don't know the system. Uh, and they don't know uh, how to approach it. Um, so they, they do get, uh, they do run into problems, and their children do run into problems. And it's, it's really sad to see. That comes out a lot in the videotapes that we do of family discussions and discussions between parents and children. So what we're doing to try to, to alert uh, people to this problem is uh, we're actually working with the school systems in the Sacramento area <clears throat> to, to alert them to the fact that there is this difficulty in the disjunction between what can be done at home and what's being done at school. And we're actually talking to the superintendents of the two school districts that we're working in about developing programs to try to remedy that and uh, increasing, for example, tutoring for uh, students whose parents don't speak English, um, increasing tutoring, the kind of tutoring they would get 
uh, from their own parents if, they, if their parents spoke English. But I think if the schools bring the parents in and work with the parents and make the school a very a good place for parents to be, uh, I think that they can strengthen the tie between the schools and the, and the parents. And with some additional efforts on tutoring and so on, hopefully a lot of that can be overcome. Okay. I have one last question over here. Uh, I was interested that your Iowa study used self-esteem as an outcome variable. As I'm sure you're aware, there's some controversy uh, among psychologists as to whether self-esteem is an important outcome that accounts for uh, positive, important things. And I'm wondering if, in fact, the Iowa study produced any evidence that self-esteem was causally related to other desired outcomes, or maybe instead it was just an indicator of desirable outcomes that had previously occurred. I've spent a lot of time chuckling about the emphasis on self-esteem in California uh, <clears throat> because it, it, it has become something of a pop psych um, effort, I think. However, our data suggests, and we haven't fully um, uh, explored this yet, people high in self-esteem tend to do better in marital and romantic relationships. Their, their relationships with others tend to be better. They tend to be more successful in their work and education. Uh, and, and I think that's because self-esteem is, is highly related with uh, some more core aspects of personality, like positive emotionality uh, and so on. Um, but I would say self-esteem does tend to be related in our study to good outcomes during the adult years. It certainly is, is related to better relationships with other people. Now, again, whether that is because it's related to other core dimensions of personality, and if we took those core dimensions and plugged them in, the effects of self-esteem would go away. I, I don't know that yet. But it's not as, uh, as uninteresting a variable as I thought it would be. Well, thank you. Uh, please join me in uh, uh, welcoming or applauding once again.